Jeff, how are you? Hey, Todd, what's going on? Good to see you. For those who are joining us, my name is Todd Rosell, uh, president and founder of Blue Rock Financial Group, and we have Jeff Kazmarczyk, um, CFA, chartered financial analyst, who is a, an advisor here at Blue Rock as well. Um, and we're going to talk about inflation. So we did this in January of 2022. It's hard to believe that it's been that long, um, but the thought process on inflation has changed dramatically since January of 22. So we figured it was time to come back together. Uh, here we are, April of 2023, um, and really walk through it as, you know, as we are today, as opposed to um, kind of just hinging on what we did in the past and assuming that that's all still relevant because most of it is. So um, as a chartered financial analyst, when we did this before, I kind of interviewed Jeff and got his thoughts on things. And the reason why Jeff is uh, on here with us is because of his designation, his breadth of experience. Um, and he's the only one at Blue Rock that holds that CFA designation. Um, and as a chartered financial analyst uh, holder, he has really the ability to work in the investment arm of a bank, uh, an insurance company, a broker dealer. Um, he could run a mutual fund. He could work for a hedge fund. So um, we're very pleased to have him not only with us today, but here at Blue Rock. And uh, his level of expertise is really going to give us some additional insight as to what's going on in the world right now as it pertains to inflation, how that impacts you, how it impacts the world. Um, while we're making no recommendations, no claims, no forecasts at the same time, it is good to have a dialogue um, on this topic because we do this internally all the time. Um, you know, what's, what's going on here? Did you hear what this person said about that? Um, and hoping that we can bring that level of understanding to you as we kind of walk through inflation uh, here in 2023. So Jeff, as we get started, um, one of the things that I wanted to get your take on is just kind of the lay of the land, you know, where we are right now um, and, you know, the transitory side of things that was really touted back in the beginning of 2022 has faded very quickly. Uh, that was pretty much gone by this time last year in 2022. So, you know, why don't we go through just kind of your take on what's going on, the, the lay of the land and, and just what's out there. All right. So thanks, Todd. So yeah, a lot has changed since the last time that we had this talk. You know, part of the talk that we had last time was whether, you know, inflation was going to be kind of transitory, kind of just in the moment, it was going to all, all go away as soon as some of those supply chain issues kind of resolve themselves or it was going to be more persistent. And I think we can kind of, you know, put the uh, later rest, the case on what the outcome of this was, is, you know, simply inflation has been uh, stubbornly persistent for at least the last 12 to 18 months. And since the last time that we have, uh, that we did this talk, you know, we saw inflation peak as high as 9.1% uh, year over year in summer, in June of 2022. And we've also seen it fall. So it ended uh, 2022, uh, the December number came in at roughly six and a half percent. So the trend has been uh, been in our favor in terms of where inflation has been moving. Uh, currently, we're sitting a little bit below that number. Uh, February came in at a, a six percent year over year number. So still, you know, overall stubbornly high. But again, we've seen this consistent decline in overall inflation. Now, one thing that I did kind of want to highlight uh, at the beginning of this talk is in addition to inflation, what our economy is really trying to come to terms with uh, operating in this environment. You know, there have been some, some, uh, some things that have happened recently. Uh, you know, headlines have been around uh, the SVB, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, and Signature Bank, uh, the fallout that may occur from that, and then just overall tighter financial conditions due to what the Fed has had to do uh, to combat inflation. But you know, from what the data has shown so far, our economy has actually continued to be pretty resilient in the face of this high inflationary environment, this tighter financial condition environment. We continue to add more jobs. Over the first two months of this year, we've added over 800,000 jobs. And many of those supply chain issues that we talked about last time that we had this talk have started to resolve themselves. Now, you know, we're not getting those pictures or the, the media is not talking about any of those container ships anymore, but there are some areas that have still need to resolve themselves. They, 
kind of, you know, if you want to talk about the, uh, you know, semiconductor industry, that that is a global supply chain that there's some other things besides just supply chain constraints that uh, that industry is working out of. But overall, you know, the global economy itself has slowly by by fits and starts got back on track since 2022. Now, if you recall, these disruptions were and, and really the rise of inflation because of these disruptions was really due to the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot happened to the supply chain. A lot of demand for orders came through, and it just couldn't happen because of the um, what we had to do to get on the other side of the COVID nineteen. Uh, you know, for example, last time we talked about used car prices. Uh, used car prices at the beginning of twenty twenty two were up nearly forty percent year over year. End of twenty twenty two, they were up just over two percent. So as you can see, some things are getting better while others are still working through. But again, the trend is moving in our favor for inflation to hopefully continue on this downward trend. Now, let's, let's spend a minute there if, you, if you're okay with it. So, sure, you know, sure. The, you talked about a couple of things when it comes to um, semiconductor uh, microchips and things like that, as well as supply chains and, and the ship uh, container ship problems that we were having, um, you know, for for year used cars to go from 41% uh, year over year to 2% year over year, things had to work themselves out fairly quickly there. Um, right. And, you know, when we talk about the Fed and we talk about, you know, rates going up and inflation being high and things along that line, um, you know, what is the Fed trying to do, Jeff? Talk us through what their goal is with raising rates and, you know, how can they really help with this inflation problem, you know, help us understand the mechanisms behind, you know, the thought process. Um, and then we can get into some of the fallout that may be coming from that. Sure. So great question. So the Fed has two mandates, pretty broad mandates, maximum employment and reasonable inflation. And their tools to do that, what well, we saw from 0809, what they did, they pulled rates all the way down to zero to stoke inflation, to stoke lending, to stoke the velocity of money, the money that's out there in the system um, to ensure that there was enough out there that we could continue on, businesses could continue on um, in a normal fashion. So now, think about after that, right? So 2008, we had a, a, a problem, right? You know, financial crisis and the Fed opened up the floodgates, so to speak, to make sure that there was access to money, to make sure that lending rates were low, to really supercharge in some ways the economy to ensure that anyone that wanted to spend money could, even though we knew right. that times were tough, right? That's kind of the, right. the, the opposite side of where we are today. Perfect. Okay. I got it. Right. Exactly. So the opposite is what is going on now. Now the Fed is trying to rein all of that in. There's okay. actually too much money in the system. And one measure of that, and this really kind of gets into the weeds a little bit, but one measure those Wall Street economists are looking at is the M2 velocity of money. And essentially what that means and why it's important is exactly what we just talked about, what we just kind of elaborated on, is the simple fact it measures how much money is in the system and the turnover of that money. So is it being saved? Is it being spent? What's going on with that? And a big reason why it, the, the runaway inflation scare, why that was grabbing headlines is, again, there was too much money out there going after too few goods. Definition of, of increased inflation, right? Uh, you know, there's people that were buying things and they could bid up the price on it. And they would do that because there was just a lot of money, uh, a lot of money out there. But now with that occurring, now the Fed's saying, hey, all of that, we're, we're good. And this started, you know, unfortunately with the pandemic, it kind of accelerated this, what the Fed had to do. Uh, you know, again, their mandate being getting inflation to a reasonable level. They were trying to get it to 2%. We flew through that because of the pandemic. And now they're trying to get on the other side of things and say, hey, we need to cool things off a little bit. Things are getting a little too crazy uh, in terms of inflation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second um, with some, you know, what, what is out there with CPI? What is what's still kind of, you know, lingering, causing this stubbornly high inflation? But it's essentially how to look at it. Uh, there's just still too much money in the system. And the Fed raising rates is their way to combat, it's their lever, lever to combat um, too much money being in the system. So yeah. So March, then if they're, yeah, if they're, okay. if they're combating it, right, they're moving rates up. 
their goal then is to slow and stop spending as much as they can, especially on higher exactly. ticket items where loans are, are usually involved, such as housing or cars or business loans and things like that, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And so, so go ahead. <laughs> now, I was just going to say, so as we talk about inflation in general, you know, used car prices were 41%. Uh, in, increased year over year last year. But if you weren't buying a used car, you were kind of isolated from that, right? That's correct. So yeah. what are some other factors that play into that inflation number? Because, you know, we got as high as 9%. But again, if you weren't buying a car, that 41% number on used cars was kind of baked into that 9%. So it was a contributing factor. What are some of the other things and areas where um, people might be seeing inflation? You know, I've seen that eggs are more are priced higher and, and different um, items at the grocery store, but you know, what about what else is in that? Yeah. So it's a, it's a pretty broad encompassing, um, index. So the consumer price index is what we, the consumer feel, see, feel that's what, you know, CNBC, Fox news, all, all the media really talk about. And there, there's a number of categories that make that up. You're right. You, you know, if you weren't in the market for a new car, you kind of, you, you, you kind of skirted, uh, feeling that, but you know, if you went to the pump, if you were going down, traveling down to the beach for vacation, you went to the gas pump, you filled up your SUV, your car, you felt it there. Um, gas heating your home. Luckily, we got we kind of got away from that a little bit this year, too. We had a warmer winter, so that really didn't affect us too much. But we are oil and gas dependent still for our energy needs. Uh, think transportation, we're booking a flight right now. It's, it's still stubbornly high. Uh, wages. Wages are another thing that is still, they're, they're continuing to increase. The demand for skilled employees is still very high. The uh, and getting paid to do take on a new job is still there. That's what's enticing people uh, to move jobs. So a lot of things underneath of the hood that other than just used cars that are keeping this high. And one, one really that I think affects majority of us is that shelter component. So think you're, you know, you own a home, I own a home, uh, that housing component of the CPI. Uh, it's, it's a large portion. Uh, you know, it makes up over 30% of the index itself and it's slow to adjust. That's the problem with this number. So rents and housing, as you can imagine, unlike oil, gas, used cars, which again, let's, let's go back to talking about that M2, the velocity of money. Now, this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with M2, but the velocity of money idea here, think of how many times you go to the gas station. You probably go maybe once, depending on it, have, if you have an SUV, you probably go twice a week. Uh, you're going pretty frequently, right? You're probably buying a new car every three, four, five years, potentially. Um, but shelter CPI, that rent and housing, it's if you think about it, and if you really think about it, it takes a while. Once you buy a home, you're probably going to be there five, seven, 10 years, maybe 30. Uh, rent, you're probably locked in for over a year. So this number, while it makes up a large portion of that CPI number that we get on a monthly basis, um, this number that makes up that, this component of it that makes up that number is really slow to show up. Yeah. So shelter CPI. And I know, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about this as well, because it's been consistently high. And we've probably seen those in the headlines again of, you know, housing prices, they've come down a little bit, but they remain high. The demand for homes, the inventory from homes is pretty low. The demand remains really high, even in light of mortgage rates increasing. Um, but shelter CPI actually moved up in February 8%. This is the highest level of housing inflation that we've seen since 1982. Hmm. It's a pretty so sig it, th that's significant. Oh, yeah. Did it move up to 8% or it moved 8% higher? Year over year. Okay. So 8% higher year over year. So February of 2022 to February of 2023, we saw an 8% move higher in that shelter CPI component um, of the overall inflation index. Now, so Jeff, why I... So real quick, because you're 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 on something right now that a lot of people you know have talked about. We we meet with real estate investors all the time. We talk to people that are in real estate. You know, real estate has its own you know little category for investing uh, as well. And people people love the idea of real estate because you're walking through the door in a fixed real asset, right? Right. Um, and if you think about that timing and why it's so slow, so the first rate hikes started to happen you know last March, right? So as we got into that rate hike starting to happen, we didn't really see that filter through the system until houses started to close in like, say, May, June, or July, because you make an offer on a property, it's accepted, then there's inspections, then there's a, a window 
um, of due diligence and back and forth before you actually, you know, finalize the sale. So it could be two, three, four, maybe even five months before a sale is finalized. Um, and loan officers have the ability to lock a rate at a certain point, right? So we may not see those things filter through for, you know, four, five, six months. So a lot of those closings are, you know, stoked upon things that happened, you know, a quarter, maybe even half a year before. So exactly. That makes a lot and of that's sense. A, it, right. And that's why, you know, it, this being a lagging indicator and that's, you know, financial economic jargon for it trails behind these other indicators, right? The stock market being the, you know, the, probably the best example of a leading indicator. Mm -hmm. It, it kind of shows what's going on a lot quicker than this, but the way that you broke it down, that is exactly what is going on right now. And also what's going on right now too. And I know we had this conversation I, yesterday is, you know, just talking to real estate agents, what's going on in the industry. There is a, there's a, a back or backlog of potential buyers that are still looking to buy homes, even at these increased rates. There's people waiting to buy that, maybe that first time home or downsize, but it, the inventory is just not there. So this one shelter, the shelter component of CPI being an overall lagging indicator. And then just the, just the current environment that we're in from a shelter component is again, it probably begs to question, you know, is this part uh, of the index? Is it going to decline anytime soon. You know, well, if you look at, look at it in, in practice and you're out there on the streets and you see it, it's mm, maybe not, but even said that, even having said that, you know, we will, we should see a little bit of a downdraft in this as all of that stuff that you had just mentioned works its way through. We have seen de uh, decrease in home, home prices. Uh, you know, those numbers have come down a little bit because of where mortgage rates themselves are at. I think the numbers, you know, if you want to go get a new mortgage right now are north of 6%, if I'm not mistaken. And that just makes things more expensive to buy, right? Your monthly payment for the same, you know, let's call it a three, $400,000 home. It's essentially doubled than what it was two years ago when we were having this talk last year, even uh, mortgage rates hadn't moved, increased that much yet, but it's a significant component uh, moving forward for those that are looking to purchase a home. Yeah, it's, that's a, that's a big swing. I mean, especially if somebody has got a budget of, you know, a thousand or 2000 or 3000 a month or whatever that number is, you're buying a lot less house if you're paying a big interest rate. And granted you, you could always right. refinance down the road if, and when rates retract. Um, but nonetheless, it, it's definitely going to slow things at some point. And it, it would make sense that with everything else slowing down a little bit, um, and we're starting to see inflation of, of closer to 6% as opposed to the peak at nine and, and housing is a lagging indicator in theory, right? Mm -hmm. We should see it start to slow a little bit and that's normal. It takes time for, you know, that real estate, uh, pricing changes and adjustments of buyers and sellers coming together. It does take time to work its way through the market, um, which, Hey, maybe that could allow some people to get into that first time home, or maybe allow people to buy a second home at a, at a little bit of a lower price, um, or maybe investment properties would, would even be a, an attractive option there for, for some folks. So, yeah. And, you know, again, it kind of, it, it kind of, it, one, it takes time. And two, unfortunately, because it makes so much of that index, yeah. maybe things have already moved in favor of, you know, all those people that you had just mentioned. It's just going to take a while for those numbers when you're going to go get your mortgage, right? For that to really, really be reflective um, within the, the data, what everything's based on. So it could be some time, but again, hopefully we see this come down or at least a move, it, it, an improved number when we get the numbers here. I think it's either this week or next week, we'll get March's number. Um, again, just because what we're seeing, like it, what, we're, what we are seeing out there right now is not really what is, you know, what the data is showing in this number. So um, we'll get an update on that really soon. Um, and that should have a pronounced effect on that overall uh, consumer price index number. Mm -hmm. So we should see a little bit move lower and that should provide a little bit more relief that may, <laughs> and I, I know this is one of the topics that we're, what we're, we're supposed to get into here, but may give uh, the Fed a reason to potentially pause. Um, yeah. So that's probably a little good segue to get into there. Um, you know, not calling the Fed to pause by any means, but there's been a lot out there that has gone on. Uh, there's a lot of things that the Fed, well, let's take a step back real quick. Again, let's go back to that Fed mandate real, really quickly and what the Fed is trying to do, what, we, what you previously spoke about. The Fed is trying to curb this. It's trying to curb inflation without right. 
being too restrictive. We have to be restrictive uh, from their standpoint to get inflation trending back down the way that it is now. But without turning us into the, uh, I don't really want to say it, but the R word, so recession, For forcing us into a recession by just what they're, what they're doing with their policy. So their last meeting, their last meeting in March came in the midst of a, some other stuff going on in the economy. Again, Silicon Valley Bank, signature bank failures. The Fed still hiked rates an additional time, 25 basis points. Pretty significant. But a change. If you think about it. But a change. It changed. Their, from their posture, which was half a point. Correct. And, you know, the, the, the market actually ex potentially saw a 50 basis point increase at that last meeting. So the 25 basis point uh, increase is actually kind of welcome news, to be honest with you. Maybe the Fed has done its job. There's a couple of things that we can look at that, you know, just to kind of gauge where monetary policy is, how the Fed is looking at things. Um, they use a little bit different of an inflation index to really keep their pulse on where inflation is at. And that is the personal consumption expenditure index or the PCE index. The difference with this index is really minute in the details, but it's just a wider basket of goods that they look at for inflation. So they're looking at many more topics, many more categories than what CPI does, what affects us as the consumer. Fed's looking at just a slightly different index. Now, where their rate is at, what that 25 basis point increase got us, it got us to a range of 4.75% to 5%. We've not what, seen that what range. Is that, what is that range of? That is their Fed funds rate. Got it. Okay. We've not seen this range since September of 2007. Pretty significant. It's been over close to two decades since the last time that the Fed has been, had their Fed funds rate at this level. Now, take a second, explain that. Explain what a Fed funds rate is um, so that people understand kind of exactly what, what that does, what it allows for, um, and what it really means to the system. Sure. So if we take a step back and look at where, where we're coming from over the last two years, we were essentially zero, just north of zero, zero to 25 basis points. So let's just call it zero. Essentially, what that means is that you, I, the consumer, banks, uh, businesses could go get a loan out at essentially, and this is really, really keeping it as simple as possible, could essentially go and borrow money for less than 1%. Pretty good because you could probably turn around and go and make 7, 10% on that money by just doing your ordinary business. So the cost of capital was zero. So it was essentially free money. So now being in this range, it's gotten more expensive to do business. It's, been, it's gotten more expensive to borrow money. It's gotten more expensive to buy a home. Um, so the Fed funds rate is essentially, it, it's the baseline of where banks borrow money at. It's what they're going to the Fed and saying, hey, I need some cash. This is what the Fed is going to charge for, for those banks and, and lending institutions to borrow money from the Fed. That reverberates through the entire economy because banks are in the business of making money. They're going to lend, they're going to set, the, set their rate above that to make, the, make a difference on, on what they are borrowing at and what they're lending at. So now we're in an environment where it's, now we've got to go back to basics, I think, for these companies to do business. Now it needs to make sense to take on additional capital. Now it makes, it makes more sense to do more thorough due diligence for those guys that are thinking about buying that next truck, buying that next plant, that new piece of equipment. Because now there, there's a cost of doing so. And it's pretty significant to go from zero to 5% over the course of the last two years. It's, it's, I, I'm pretty sure it's one of the quickest increases in the Fed fund rates ever. They've done this yeah. before because, again, the Fed is trying to keep maximum employment and keep inflation under control to mandates. And their lever is putting money into the system and taking money out of the system. That's how they do it. That's their only mechanism, to be honest with you. So being at this level, again, it's now... We can, businesses need to be more cost conscious when they're going and um, thinking of taking on more debt. Yeah. So let's stay with that. So the Fed funds rate is, you know, you had mentioned it's the rate that banks borrow money from the Fed at. So that's the rate that they pay the Fed. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times that rate is paid and that money is borrowed to meet overnight requirements because banks have requirements that they need to meet minimums 
uh, based on deposits. They have to have a certain a percentage of those deposits available. Um, and when that is calculated is overnight. So that's why it's called the overnight rate. Um, and it's the cost that banks pay the Fed to borrow that money. Um, right. And let's think about this. So while, while we're on the bank side of things, um, we did have a couple failures um, and they were unique to this point. The, the Federal Reserve actually made some comments uh, about bank failures and what we can expect moving forward. Um, but I'll share a little bit of experience that I had. So I sat on the community powered federal credit union board for about nine years. Um, and I did so through the financial crisis. Um, it was a very well-managed institution, relatively small, um, but we had money that would come into the credit union or a bank in this, in this situation. Um, and we needed to do something with that money simply because we weren't in a position to lend it all out. Ideally, you'd love to lend it to your um, you know, patrons, your customers, and you know, have that on your books, but there wasn't always the, enough demand to satisfy the lending for the uh, money that was on the book. So you had to invest it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember we would invest mostly in mortgage backed securities, which was at that time, it was kind of counterintuitive, or at least you thought it was because of the mortgage crisis that we were going through. Um, but right. historically they had paid the best rate, relatively speaking. And, you know, what that really meant was that we had to rate test or shock the investment portfolio, because if rates moved, AKA what's happening now, whether they moved a hundred basis points or 1%, 2% or 3%, how would that impact the value of the assets that we hold? So, you know, we would go through and the investment committee would share the findings and it always got, you know, a little bit wonky when you got up to that 300 basis point shock. Um, because the way that the um, securities or bonds that we were buying would work is they would have a definitive amount of time um, that we would keep them on the books. Um, yield to maturity was typically what we were looking at. So how much yield would we receive until those bonds were to mature um, or yield to call? How much would we receive until they were able to be called back by the issuing institution? Um, and that rate shock would always be you know, something that we would look at and say, okay, well, we hope we never see that. Um, and the reason why is because the value of those assets on the book would come down value wise if the rate were to go up 1%, 2%, or 3%, which is what we've seen now. Um, and banks are the same. So they have assets that they deploy. Those assets are invested in something, right? Right. And, you know, as long as there's not a run on the bank, you still receive that interest payment from the investments that you receive. Specifically in the Silicon Valley Bank situation, um, they had very, very large depositors that were in the tech industry, um, very concentrated as far as, um, you know, sector. And a lot of their deposits were well over the FDIC um, $250,000 per account level. Um, so if you had one depositor that came in and wanted to take out $5 million, you had to give that depositor $5 million. Right. Um, and that puts a lot of pressure on the bank balance sheet to be able to produce that money. Some instances you were having to sell assets that were um, at a loss, which then translates down to the balance sheet. And it shows that uh, the bank on paper is not solvent. So mm -hmm. um, as we look ahead, you know, all banks, all credit unions, they have to invest this excess cash in order for them to be able to pay interest rates that, you know, the market is demanding. Um, and make money. Banks are not in, in the business of exactly. being a nonprofit. They're in the business to make right. money. So, you know, these are, these are things that the Fed has already said, you know, hey, be aware that, you know, if you have more than $250,000 in an account, you, that you could potentially be at risk. Um, the Fed has also said, Janet Yellen in particular, if, this, if there's a bank that's important or integral to the functioning of the system, that they're probably going to be okay, um, which leaves some banks in a situation where they may not be okay. So again, trying to be forward thinking and knowing that, all right, we've seen a rate hike that's been higher than the 300 basis points over the last year, that it, this is probably not over. Um, we're probably going to see some more of this. Um, and it, it definitely means that we need to be diligent as consumers to ensure that the banking institutions that we are with um, don't have more money than they should of, our, of ours. Um, in addition, many of the banking institutions aren't paying those high rates that the market is um, demanding. Um, so it's another good reason for 
clients and consumers to take a look and say, all right, well, what am I getting on my cash? And, you know, should I be doing something different with it? So, you know, cash is the first time in a while that cash can really be counted as an asset class um, because in many, you know, instances over the last 12 to 15 years, we've almost not even counted cash at all. It's been a complete loser. Yeah. I had, so, I mean, a hunt for yield, right? I mean, maybe taking a little too much risk because cash just wasn't, just wasn't there in terms yeah. of any yield or return perspective. And I think yeah. if, if you don't mind, you know, one, one thing with, with banks right now, it's, and I think it's actually perfect timing here to maybe explore some other options instead of just checking savings accounts. Mm-hmm. To be honest with you, banks really don't want your deposits anymore. No. You know, that's why we're seeing these, these muted increases in checking savings, standard checking savings in accounts. Um, because banks just, they, they can't find a better use for your money. So I think you're, you know, the example that you use sitting on that board is it's exactly where we're at right now. There's still too much money in the system. Mm-hmm. Banks can't find a better alternative to pay any interest to really take your money for free, lend it out and make a spread. They're, they're making their spread. They're just not rewarding us because they don't, they, don't, they don't want our money. And I don't mean to make light of it, yeah. but it's just a simple reason as to why there's, you know, exploring high yield savings accounts, you know, uh, you know with us, our, our money market account simple strategies, a treasury, a, a tr- buying a treasury. Those are where you're seeing those rates. So exploring other options that are out there, because as, as you just alluded to, there, there's opportunity for cash to be a meaningful part of a portfolio again, at least you know, for it, the short term, right? Until we find another opportunity to maybe deploy that capital and earn a higher rate of return, depending on situation. Right. But, um, but yeah, it, it's, it's kind of crazy to see this, just the simple fact that banks, they just, they don't want our deposits anymore, at least for right now. Yeah. Um, now, and you're right. I mean, we've got access to, you know, opportunities, which could pay a client 4%, 5%, you know, that, which is something that at a fixed rate, we just haven't had that, you know, that tool in our toolbox for a very long time. Right. Um, you know, and as we look at, you know, what's ahead, a lot of times as we go through these, these challenges in, you know, a rising interest rate environment, we will tend to see layoffs eventually. We will tend to see uh, banks actually pull the reins in on credit. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And we've got some time to get through this. We're still kind of on the front end, I think, based upon, you know, what most of the experts, so to speak, are saying. And, um, you know, knowing what I saw in the credit union, I would, I would tend to agree with that. We are relatively on the front end of this. So see what happens. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's just to kind of elaborate, I mean, you know, it's not even just on the Fed anymore. Again, it's with the banks now, these tighter financial conditions, they, like you just mentioned, they may not be as willing to lend anymore. You know, the, the fallout from Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, it's going to have repercussions. It's not to say that the same thing that happened to those two banks is going to spread to others, but it may give a little, uh, a little cause for concern. Banks may not just be willing just to underwrite anything and, and lend out money. So that could help the Fed along. With, so the Fed won't have to do anything, but conditions continue to tighten. Con- conditions continue to tighten. Money is not, you know, that velocity of money, it slows down. Inflation, therefore, would come down as well, too. So there's a lot, a lot going on out there um, moving forward. Again, I, I, I agree with you that I think we're on the, the front end of all of this. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, the market overall, it's been resilient, even in the face of all of this going on. So, yeah. well, Jeff, I've got a good question for you and a good segue. And I always like to tell a little bit of a story or, you know, have an analogy as we get there. So, sure. you know, I want to, I want to get your, in your, your, your take on the stock market value versus growth, kind of some of the changes that we can expect or what traditionally happens in that arena. But um, in comparing the stock market, which you kind of already did a little bit to, you know, the feds tools that are in their toolbox to curb inflation, I've always thought of it more as like the, the stock market's kind of like a car on the road, right? You turn and you see that, you know, you get the responsiveness of that quick turn. Whereas the fed trying to fight inflation, I've always thought of it more of kind of like a boat. Cause if you've ever driven a boat, you know, you can't just turn it and it won't turn. And then you got to fight with the wind. You got to fight with the current. There's these external you know, factors that you really have to, to think about. And, you know, when turning a boat, you almost have to turn it before you're supposed to turn and not turn as far as you think you're going to need to go. And you, know, you got to be very strategic with that to make sure that you don't, you know, run into another boat <laughs> or something sure. along that right. line. Um, but, you know, let's talk about the stock market. So, you know, people always ask us what's going to happen. <laughs> and of course we always tell them we have no idea, but 
um, you know, things that have traditionally happened or things that we're aware of. Um, and I, I want to keep this really at a high level. If we're talking about the differences between value and growth, we know what's happened. Um, and I'll let you expand on it over the last five to 10 years in the growth category and what we're thinking um, we could potentially see or, or how markets typically change um, as we get into the type of an environment that we're in. So, Sure. So let's just take a step back and let's look at what happened in 2022. Overall in the stock market, it was a tough year. It was a tough year, not, not just in stocks, but it was a tough year in bonds because of exactly what we're talking about here today, inflation and what the Fed is doing to combat inflation. What took it on the chin really badly last year was growth stocks. Growth stocks are typically, um, you know, it, it think, think of your tech companies. It's the simplest example of all of that. You know, cash flow may not be that, that robust. Uh, they're in growth phase. So anything that they're making, they're plowing right back into the company. And that's essentially what different, differentiates a growth stock from a value stock uh, in the most binary sense of things. Um, growth stocks tend to be, you know, as a stock market investor, we're buying those future potential profits and growth stocks are technically, you know, we're kind of running, we're trying to find that crystal ball of where they're going to end up at in five, 10 years. And we're buying that and we're buying it forward. So when inflation hits and there's going to be these increase in rates, again, going back to talking about how cash is expensive, it hits growth stocks a lot harder than it does value stocks. Both get hit. But growth stocks get hit a little bit harder because one, they're still reliant on, on money that is lent to them. And two, if you really get into the weeds and you plug it into the models that project these future potential cash flows that haven't been realized yet, it makes it more expensive. Essentially, their future cash flows are more expensive to be purchasing today. Now, the same thing is happening on the value side of, the, of this uh, equation. It's just the simple fact that a value, a value company or value categorized company typically has robust cash flows to really weather the storm with all of this. They're not as reliant on outs outsource of investor money, of bank, bank money that's being lent to them. They have a durable business. So think, you know, Kraft mac and cheese. I have to, I have two little girls. They love their Kraft <laughs> mac and cheese. There was no way, no matter what the cost of, we were going to be eating Kraft mac and cheese. But Kraft makes all of those really those consumer staples. We're go they're going to be bought no matter what. And so that is a really robust cash flow source, something that value stocks have. So when you look at it and you break down the stock market in, in, in terms of those two lines, value stocks tend to outperform. Even if they do get hit, they tend to outperform growth stocks because there's less of a concern of the business of it, the business model itself with a value stock. Now, when we move to the the fixed income side of things, you know, that unfortunately, just by the math of things, and we already kind of talked about this uh, a little bit, um, as assets were going into that, rates are going up, the price of those bonds are coming down, and that's what we saw last year. So it was really difficult on the fixed income market. Now, let's move forward real quickly into 2023, and where we started the year, it's actually pretty good. S&P ended the first quarter, it was up 7%. NASDAQ, so those growthy tech stocks, was up over 16, almost 17% in one quarter. From the December lows for the NASDAQ, it's up over 20%. Now, for Wall Street jargon, that means that we've actually, we're out of the bear market, we're in, into the next bull market phase. Not sure that's necessarily true, but that's kind of how the numbers flush themselves out in this first quarter. Now, why did that happen? It's the reverse of what's happened previously that we saw in 2022. That inflation fear, it's gone down a little bit the growth stocks because of that, they're pricing in that those future cash flows aren't going to be as expensive. Value stocks, they're still just chugging along. Problem with all of it moving forward is again, the cost of doing business is still expensive. Um, but it's kind of those value stocks, you, they're, they're, re, they're redoing their models. They're, they're running their projections, their due diligence. They're incorporating maybe a prolonged higher inflationary environment, a Fed funds rate at this 4.75 to 5% range. Business will get done. Business has been done before at these levels. As again, we haven't seen these levels since September of 2007. Business was booming back in 07. So it can be done. Will it be done again? Sure. But as the, your boat analogy, I think is perfect. It takes a long time to really right the ship here. I mean, we're talking about the US economy. It's not just, you know, the mom and pop uh, store on the corner here that, you know, can 
uh, you know, block and tackle on a whim day to day. We're talking about the U.S. economy, uh, the, the forefront or the forerunner of the global economy. So it's going to take a, take a long time for all of this to kind of work itself through. But, you know, historically speaking, we, we've worked through it. It just takes some time. Your, your uh, explanation there on growth and value is perfect. I mean, growth, the, the whole point is buy at 10 and sell at 20. Um, and value, those companies have the ability to pay dividends and they don't need to have these huge returns for the owner of those stock positions to see um, a profitable relationship or, or value, for lack of a better term, um, yeah. from them. So, you know, that, that's perfect. And, you know, it's exactly right. So we're going to see what happens. I mean, you know, that, that shift back to um, having that, that growth sector do so well was a little bit unexpected for the beginning of 2023. But, you know, I think that does speak to the inflation fear starting to come down a little bit. So yeah. <clears throat> anything in closing, Jeff, I think is fantastic. No, I, I, I think this was great timing with everything, you know, having this talk uh, with everything going on. It, you know, it seems like the market is responding well to maybe, you know, the Fed being done or at least inflation not running rampant anymore. Um, and, you know, I think that there are some, some good opportunities out there to really, you know, if it not necessarily maybe, you know, taking what's happened already in the stock market and uh, chasing after it, but with just cash in itself, I think it's now back to a very um, important part of a portfolio and just making sure that we're getting returns on that cash and just not giving banks more money to, um, you know, lend out and not give us something in return as investors. So, um yeah, I think, I think it's a good close. And, you know, again, we're Blue Rock Financial Group. Um, if you like this video, please share, comment on whatever platform you are seeing it on. Um, if there are questions that you have on your specific individual situation, we're happy to jump on a Zoom, see you face-to-face. -face. Um, but everyone's situation is a little bit different. And as we started, you know, nothing on here was meant to be a recommendation specifically for an individual, more so just a broad brush of the landscape that we're seeing today. Um, and, you know, something can change tomorrow and completely change the direction um, of the economy, could change the direction of the stock market. So, um, you know, just like those that you see on TV, nobody truly knows exactly where it's going to go. We can really only look at past trends and, and understand what's expected. Um, but, you know, who knows what's going to happen? Uh, what I will say is that our goal is to provide you as a client confidence so that you are confident that you will be able to do what you want to do regardless of what happens out there outside of your four walls. So again, thank you, Todd Rosell, Blue Rock Financial Group, Jeff Kazmarczyk. Thank you so much for being part of this. Right. Thank and, you, uh, everybody. We'll do it again soon. Absolutely. Absolutely.